I want you to think of an image. It can be anything. It could be an image of the Mona Lisa, or of the Apollo 11 mission, or maybe a nostalgic image from your childhood. Well, what if I told you that whatever image you thought of, and a near infinite number more, all exist within a website you can access right now? What is this mysterious website I am talking about? Well, it is called the Babel Image Archives. This website contains an image of every single photograph that has ever been taken. It has images of all of the artwork that has ever been created. It even has images of every moment of your life, and of the life of every one of the 117 billion human beings who have ever existed on this planet. And all of those images combined aren't even one millionth of a percent of the total images within the Babel Image Archives. Now you are probably wondering, how is it possible for a website to contain so many images? Well, the magic of the Babel Image Archives is that it doesn't. Imagine if every image that can be represented digitally had a unique key corresponding to it. And this key could then be used to reconstruct the image later on. This is what the Babel Image Archives does, instead of storing images. It simply converts keys, or what it refers to as locations, into images. This concept is deeply fascinating, but if you are trying to randomly look for anything of value, you only get lost in an infinite sea of noise. So in order to counteract this, the Babel Image Archives actually has a feature that allows you to upload an image, and it will generate the location of that image within the archives. Now this whole process works fine, but the values of these locations aren't small. In fact, to call them enormous would be an understatement, as they are over 900,000 digits long. And to make matters even worse, the resolution of these images is capped at a crisp 640 by 416. So if you wanted to work with any other resolution, well, you're out of luck. So with all of these issues in mind, I started to wonder if I should try and write my own version of this concept, but better. And that's what I decided to do. And boy was it a bumpy ride. So let's go through the journey of how I created my own image archives. Alright, to get started on this project, I began by writing out some boilerplate code to get our application up and running. Now I'm writing this project in C++, which is what I use for most of my projects, but as you will soon see, this probably wasn't the best choice for this specific project. But regardless, we now have a window that we can use to build our application inside of. So with that now out of the way, I think it's time to explain how this program is going to work. To begin, one of the problems I mentioned a moment ago about the Babel image archives is that the image locations are really large. So one of the ways we could cut down on the number of digits required to store each location is by including other characters than just numbers. Since the Babel image archives uses base 10 numbers to store its locations, there is only 10 possible values that could be stored per digit. But if we decide to include characters into this as well, both lowercase and uppercase, we can increase this total to 62 values. But if we do this, why not add even more? In fact, we can use up to 127 different values, since there are seven bits available to us for each character byte. But we actually can take this idea even further with something called Unicode. Unicode is a text encoding that is capable of encoding more than 1.1 million different characters. So what this means for us is that if we're able to utilize Unicode characters for our locations, we could push the amount of data we could store per character way higher than it would otherwise be. Now, as I vaguely mentioned, C++ probably isn't the best language for this project. And that's because C++ doesn't exactly have a good reputation for supporting Unicode, unlike languages like Python. So the only way for me to be able to encode anything with larger values that Unicode requires is by using a data type called W character, or wide character. This data type is two bytes long as opposed to a regular character's one byte, so this means that we could store a full 16 bits of data, which pushes the number of possible characters available to us up to 65,535, or the 16-bit integer limit. And that's a huge improvement from the 10 we originally had. So now that we know what we are going to use to represent the location of images in our archive, we now have a new question to answer. How do we go from an image location to an image, and vice versa? Well, this question was something that I tried to solve using a couple of different methods, 
but each one ended up failing and had to be scrapped. But after a lot of headache-filled evenings, I finally managed to settle onto an idea. Since each character that we are using can store 16 bits of data, why not split the data of each one of these characters up into multiple sections, and then have each section represent its own pixel? As an example, if I split a 16-bit value into two sections, each section will be 8 bits long, which would give me 255 possible color values for two different pixels, all within one character. So that means if we had an image with 10,000 pixels per se, we would only need 5,000 characters to be able to represent its location. Now, implementing the code to handle this process was pretty tricky to write. This was because I had to do some weird bit manipulation that I'm not very used to doing. One thing I should specifically mention about this code is that when I initially wrote it, I had it hard-coded to only store two values per character. But later on, I updated this code so that it could store a variable amount. But this comes at the cost of the pixel's color data, since fewer bits will be used for each pixel. For now though, here is what the program currently looks like. Here we have a low resolution image that I filled with some grayscale noise. And if we check the console, it gives us the location of that image using Unicode characters. Now the next step from here was adding some code to load in whatever images I wanted to. And as you could see with our C++ logo, it works correctly. From here, I began working on creating a GUI to give this program some personality and so that I could finally interact with the program in real time. And this process gave me the opportunity to finally flesh out some of the other features that I thought were lacking when it came to the Babel image archives, such as the resolution of the images being capped. But as I was continuing this process, I ran into a major issue with our image locations. Remember how I said that since the wide character data type we are using is 16-bit, we have access to 65,535 different characters? Well, this isn't completely true, because the Unicode encoding contains regions of character values called private use areas. These are regions of Unicode values that are undefined and can be reserved for different programs. But in our case, it just ends up breaking our program if we ever have a character within one of these values. So I tried adding some code to round any of the values within this region to the nearest valid character, and this kind of worked for my black and white color palette, but for full color, it ends up ruining the images. So what can we do about this? Well, it might seem kind of unsatisfying, but since the regions I am trying to avoid begin towards the end of the 16-bit integer limit, I decided to knock off the final bit for our locations. So now we have 15 bits of information instead. So we lose a little bit of color data, but it completely resolves the issue, which is the important thing. With that major issue out of the way, I pushed forward with some of the remaining features I had left to implement, such as the ability to change the number of values stored within each character, as I alluded to earlier. But since the program is now complete, let me show you how it works. With the program open, you could see that we have a large black area in the middle of the screen right now. This is where the images that we work with will be displayed. So if I want to open up an image, I could press the Load Image button, and it will be parsed by our program and then displayed. Now, I could change the size of the image by using these sliders, as well as changing it from grayscale to color and vice versa. We can also alter the number of pixels that are stored per character, and increasing this number will affect the quality of the image, since each pixel has less information to work with. But if we look at the header, you could see that the number of characters for the image location decreases dramatically, so it's a trade-off. Now once we make an image we like, we can either save the image as an image, or save its location to a text document. If I save the location to my computer and open up the file, you can actually see the Unicode representation of the image. And if I restart the program and load in this text document, it will reconstruct the image corresponding to that image location. So in effect, this means that you could send your friends images in the form of text documents. And if the text document itself was encrypted, there's essentially two layers of protection from anybody who would want to see your image. Now, this program does have its flaws, like the fact that it's only using 15 of the 16 bits per character, but overall, I'm pretty happy with how this program turned out. And if you would like to mess around with it, it will be on my GitHub, which is linked down below. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, despite it being a little different from what I normally do. If you have any weird project ideas that you think would be interesting for me to attempt, 
always feel free to leave them down in the comments below. But either way, thank you guys as always for watching and for your continued support, and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye